You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Then we're on. And today's guest, we've got Big Gene. How are you, brother? Hey, what's going on, Mr. English? What's going on with you? Really good, mate. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate you having me. Bodyguard for all the celebrities, known to being uh, P. Diddy's uh, main guy. You were there when Biggie was killed. You've worked with 50 Cent. You've been a, a bouncer as well, a doorman. You've done a lot of stuff in your life. Yes, um, very outspoken as well, but very well respected. A lot of people do like you out there. You've released a book, which we'll plug straight away. Where can people buy your book? Well, they can buy it on Amazon, or they can uh, hit me at um, Big Gene on Cash App or PayPal, Big Gene 52, and um, I will send one out. If you're over in the UK, you have to pay a little extra for the postage, but if you're here in America, uh, just the regular postage and stuff like that. It's $50. Before we get into everything, though, I always like to go back to the start with my guests, get more of a bit of understanding about Eugene, where you grew up and how it all began. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, until about, I was 12 years old, then I moved, when I met my mother at 12, I moved with her in the little subdivision of St. Louis County, which called Wellston, and I stayed there until I graduated uh, high school. And the day I graduated from high school, the next day I went to college to play ball at Alcorn State University in the SWAC in Lorman, Mississippi. When you say met your mother, what happened? Um, at the age of two, my grandfather uh, came to my mother's house. He didn't like the situation. She had left us with some people. He took us, me and my little brother, uh, which was just one, and I was going on three. He took us from my mother and told her not to never step foot in my, his house or come and see us. So. We grew up thinking that our grandparents were our parents until my grandfather got on his deathbed and died. And that's when I met my mother for the first time. How was that feeling, thinking you have been raised by your mum and dad, not finding out it was your grandparents? Uh, the situation would have been better if the household was what it was supposed to be in a traditional, you know, grandparents where they was taking care of the kids and everything like that. But my grandfather was a gambler, he was um, a street guy. He worked every day, but he had a real bad gambling problem. He used to gamble with Sonny Liston and a lot of other people that were in uh, the mob and stuff like that, you know, you know, screwing people with bad guys in St. Louis, Missouri. So um, you hardly ever seen him, but then when you saw him, nine times out of 10, you was getting a beating. So it was, pretty bad growing up with him, but it made you strong and made me who I am today. Do you think that shapes you as a kid, who you are later on in life with the stuff that you go through? It depends on who else you meet in life. I met a man named Willie Drake Sr. He was a guy who was in, a, in the armed forces from Philadelphia, uh, raising his family on the block where her mother lived at. And he taught me what it was to be a man and whatever happened to me as a child, let that stuff go and uh, become a man that you want to be. And that's putting in the work that you want to do to be who you want to be. See, when you were raised by your grandparents, did you have an inkling of like an understanding of there's something not quite right or did you just 100% believe that it, that it was your parents? It would, I 100% hundred, hundred believed it was my parents until my me and my aunt got into it. And I had got big enough for them to stop picking on me because they used to pick on me a lot. Um, and then when we got into a fight, she told me, you know, because she was upset that I had beat her up, you know, uh, know that my grandmother wasn't my mother. And all the big beans in the sp got spilled. And then when my mother came, when my father, my grandfather was sick, then all of it came to light. What was that feeling for you? Um... I didn't understand it because I didn't understand what it was to be loved because that wasn't a, 
a word in our household. So if you don't understand what love is, how can love hurt you? So I didn't really understand. It's just that I just thought that's what it was. Because at the time when I grew up, uh, you do what I say, not what you do what I tell you, not what you, what you see. It's, it was like you got to realize in, in, in a, a black American family, the child wasn't able to speak his voice or say what he say or really have feelings. You know, they were, you know, my grandparents were strict uh, Southerners that, you know, you you found they found they love in an extension card, a belt, or you know, and beating you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you know, you did what they told you to do, and you felt how they told told you to feel. Mm. More fear. Yeah, it was a fear until you get to the point where you just don't fear anymore. You know what I mean? You learn like when I got to the point where is that? No, I'm not taking no more ass whoopings. I'm not taking no more beatings. Then that's when it became fear for them. What was it like? What were you like at school? Unbelievable. I was pretty smart. I had an aunt that was Joyce Deal. She was high on education. And she she would teach me everything, even when I was getting beaten for using my left hand, you know, because, you know, as a child growing up, they thought it was bad for you to be left-handed. So she kept me whereas I was getting A's and B's and it was, I did pretty well in, in uh, grade school and middle school and things like that. How was your temper? My temper? Um, I don't think I had a temper. I, w I wasn't the guy that was, uh, I picked on people or did nothing like that. Um, I was a guy that I wasn't turning down no fights, but I wasn't the type of guy that I was, I had to get into a fight and I had to do that because it was big in my neighborhood that I grew up, everybody, you know, fought or boxed or did sports or something like that. So you having a temper didn't make a difference. You know, I learned at an early age, the ones who lose his head is the one who lose the fight. Mm -hmm. Because usually people who are abused kind of getting beat by parents, grandparents become abusers themselves or bullies when they just become full of hate and rage. I think that's, uh, I think when you deal with sports and you get into sports at an early age uh, and then you meet people in your life that can help you like my uh, Papa Drake did, um, it can turn that around. You know what I'm saying? You know, he was a boxer in the army. He played basketball. All the things that I loved, you know, he he helped me, you know. So when I was sharpening my skills in basketball and boxing, you know, he was the one who taught me. And he would always not only teach you the game of fighting, he would educate you about the knowledge of boxing or uh, or learning the technique of uh, boxing and basketball so you could outdo your opponent. So you had to have your head right. You could never lose your head. He would always tell you, you know, you can't lose your head. You lose your head, they got you. Was a sport a getaway for you as well where you could release a lot of anger? Well, I would say you call it anger, but I didn't look at it as being anger. It was just the personality that I knew. It was just something that uh, you grow up with. So I wasn't like, I'm angry at everybody, angry at the world and nothing like that. Nah, uh, it wasn't like that. You know, I, I can't say that. Even though I didn't have, even though I was the type of kid that I would go to neighbor's house because we may not have a meal, you know what I'm saying? And just be praying and hoping that they you, you could eat over there or something like that. But I wasn't, um, in spite of what I've seen and what I've uh, been around and what I worked with for the years, because, you know, I was a parole officer for years. And I could see whereas that people who had those lies and where they end up that. So I don't think that I was an angry person. What was your first ever job? 
What was your first ever job? Oh, shoveling snow. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> shoveling snow, if you want to call it. <laughs> so, cleaning out people pathways, you know, trying to make a little extra money, uh, cutting grass, um, selling bottles, you know, going down the alley, collecting bottles, then go sell them. Work at the uh, grocery stores when you uh, picking up uh, bagging people groceries and carrying them to their cars or carrying them to their houses. Um, what else? Working, uh, if you're talking about legal, when you first got a paycheck, when you did summer youth, you know, and because they have the summer youth jobs where you cut the grass and stuff like that and work in different places, centers. Those were my first jobs. But my first job out of college, I was a youth counselor and um, a counselor at Brandeis High School. What made you choose being a youth counselor? Is it because of the stuff that you went through as a kid so you could understand? No, I think it's just like when you first get out of college, you don't know what you really want to do. You know you went and got this degree, but whatever could pay the bills first until you get settled or you just keep on putting in uh, applications and you keep on uh, putting in your resume to do something that you want to do. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't nothing had to do with, uh, the guy said I was good at it, I was great at it. And that was probably based on my 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 rearing, how I came up. But I didn't go say, yo, I want to be a youth counselor, or I want to be into uh, the Department of Juvenile Justice, or nothing like that. It just, it just happened, it just was a job. What happened with the basketball career? Um, I was the leading scorer and the leading rebounder coming back from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. We had just got a new coach. He just wrote a book. His name is Mac McCarthy, right? And uh, he brought me into his office. Now, we had people like Willie White, Russ Shaney, Gerald Wilkins, the year prior to me going there, had gone to the pros, you know what I'm saying? So the professional... The pros was looking at our school, and I've had um, a top one of the top guys in basketball said uh, his name was Gene Barto from University of Alabama. He had wrote and said that I was probably one of the best unknown big forwards, you know, um, at a uh, at a uh, at a uh, Division One A school. Uh, when Mac McCarthy came in there and became the coach. Um, he wanted to bring his new guys in and things like that. And he set everybody down. He set me down separately because he wanted to talk to us. And he told me if I didn't kiss his ass, I wasn't going to play a University of Tennessee uh, mock minute. And I told him, I'm going to get my degree. I ain't going to have to kiss your ass or nobody else's ass and walked out of his office. So uh, he had it out for me. Uh, I still came to practice every day bust everybody ass in front of me, played hard. You can look at the stats, you can look at, you can ask any member from the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga at that time, from Dwight Harris, Mo, uh, uh, Maurice, or what is Mo Head? Maurice Head, James Hunter, anybody who played at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga from 84 to 86, that I deserve to be the starting player coming out of there. But he just benched me, and he used other players to come at me. And one player came at me after we had the season was over. We was going into the playoffs, and I broke his nose, broke his jaw, and hurt him pretty bad. And they threw me off the team. Why did the target you? Why did the coach target you? Is that is it racism involved, or how does it? I wouldn't say no, no racism because I would say racism. I think the fact that when you had somebody that was as strong as me mentally and that uh, you want to show the players that you see this guy, he comes to practice every day. He's going to school to get his education. You understand? But I'm gonna, I don't give a shit about that. I'm going to show y'all no matter what he does, if he don't kiss my ass, he's not going to play on this team. 
So he wanted that power with the team. So who better yet to use? The strongest person on the team, the person to go into class. I'm going to show you, I'm going to use him as an example. No matter what you do, it's going to be up to me. So what happened after you kicked out? Uh, went on and finished my education. Uh, Could you finish your education even though you beat someone up? Yeah, he attacked me. It just, didn't, <laughs> it just, it just didn't work out the way he thought it was. <laughs> so you can still stay at college. Even yeah, 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 yeah. Because um, he didn't press charges. I didn't press charges, and I was just still able. I was under contract for that year, so I finished off that year, you know, and graduated. How was it getting a degree? How was that feeling? Uh, being the first deal that ever do that it felt good but I didn't have the family backing as you thought that people should have when they had accomplished something like that so um I just got my degree and three years three days later moved to New York why that why New York um I had a chance to go overseas to play ball in Germany and with this guy, Jackie Knowles, he was going to help me. And my girlfriend was from New York. So I went to stay with her and her parents until I was getting ready to go overseas. And what did you do then? I tore my knee up, my meniscus. <laughs> and the doctor told me that uh, if I continued to play ball, uh, I wouldn't be walk walking when I got 50 years old. So that's when I became a youth counselor and started working with uh, the Manhattan Valley Youth Program and uh, Brandeis High School. And how, what's it like working with the, the high school and the program here? Is it for naughty kids? Is it for damaged kids? How, how does it work? Well, for the program, it was for damaged kids. Mm -hmm. For the high school, it was basically for kids who were uh, targeted, who had a uh, attendance problem. So, you know, we had to make sure, keep their attendance correctly, go out to their house, speak with their parents, let their parents know that they were having, you know, it's like a truancy program and everything that we were doing. What do you think the main ingredient is for people being naughty, being bad? Do you see the resemblance of them being bullied and abused as kids or is it something totally different in your, in your own mindset? Well, it could be a lot of different things. Uh... You have kids that have been abused and, and and never be bad and, you know, go to school, do what they have to do. Then you have kids that are abused and they take it out on others. Uh, like I said, it's, it's all, I believe it's all individual, man. And it's who you meet in your life or who comes in your life, if, even if you having bad things happen to you in your home environment. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. So, uh those people who are who get abused and take it out on others, they probably had nobody good come into their life to show them or help them or let them see that they could be something different. Mm -hmm. How long did you, because you've done that for what, 23 years? Well, I was a parole officer for 27 years. 27 years? Yeah, but I, I worked in, in social service for all together for like 30 years. So how did you build up the reputation of working with some of the biggest stars on the planet? Was it a man called Will or something? <laughs> no, Will Van had nothing to do with it, man. Um, we had started this crew called The Same Gang. But see, back in St. Louis, when I was in high school, we had DJ crews, you know, and DJ crews was groups that the guys would DJ MC on the mic. So you got your crew with you, you got your top MC. So those top MC has to have, they have to have people to protect them and they have to have, you know, security. They had to have, you know, uh, people around them. And I was one of the guys who were, was protecting them and I also was a DJ. And one of the top DJs back in St. Louis was Dr. Shock. Uh, his name was Philip Haynes. And it was called Future Shock Music Production. They went on and uh, broke up and they changed it to Dynamite Disco. So in St. Louis, they had like five top DJ groups back in that time. And this was about 78, 79. And it was Future Shock Music Production, Dynamite Disco, R.E. Trice, Shotgun, and Holly Rock Productions. 
So those five groups used to all battle each other and everything like that, go to little clubs. So one of the guys who were on our team was a black belt in karate. So his name was Cedric Malone. He's a pastor out in Virginia, I think now. Uh, I couldn't afford karate. So I would come over and help him with his chores, cut his grass, take out his garbage, do all that type of shit like that, whatever he had to do, and he would teach me karate and beat me up in the interim of teaching me. So he he got me up to being a brown belt, almost a black belt. This guy named Benny Smith used to run boxing over at the Salvation Army. So when we go over there to play at the Salvation Army, and Salvation Army used to give you free meals. So you used to go over there and get your free meal at the Salvation Army. You could play and everything like that. Benny Smith would teach the people boxing, so I learned boxing from him. But when I came to New York, I had already been good at boxing, good and fighting. You could see that. Uh, I was the enforcer on our basketball team, and some go down. You know, they try to, you know, bum rush the team or somebody have a problem on the floor. I would be the first one to grab somebody or whatever like that. So um, we had started this crew called The Same Gang here in New York City when I came here. And it's a, it's a top rapper. He's known now. It's called ASAP Ferg. His father's name was D. Ferg. He was a designer. If you ever seen the Bad Boy logo or that Uptown Cat or Uptown Records, he was designed, the one who designed that. So um, he used to work at the same youth program I worked at. And uh, when we began to um, hang out with each other and everything like that, and he loved the way I played basketball, all this and everything like that. And in New York City, at that time, all the drug dealers was playing, paying a lot of money for basketball players to come out and play for them. You understand? So I was like a ringer because they didn't know me. You understand? Here I am, 6'7", you know, much thinner back then, could do 360s, jump out the gym, all this <laughs> shit like that. I became a ringer because nobody knew me. You know what I'm saying? Um, so we started this crew called The Same Gang. You know what I'm saying? So we used to give parties, boat rides, picnics, the whole nine yards. So because he had did that design for Puff Daddy, that bad boy design, um, he had did that Uptown Record design also. We were in the movie theater one time and all hell broke out. And I was standing next to this guy named Rick Dog. He was a part of our crew. And the guys were just fighting right there. I'm like, yo, damn, this shit is crazy. He said, yo, Gene, go help them. I said, my man, you don't want me to help them. You understand? He said, Gene, go help them. And then after that, I, I just. Is that how your career started? That's how my career started. I'm just talking about like, as far as, you know, they seeing what I could do with my yeah, hands. Because you could handle yourself. Yeah, and, yeah. I could, and, and, and somebody else too. <laughs> <laughs> so. They saw that. So then Puff got into a problem and he wasn't even part of the same gang. He was just a friend of D. Fur. And he said, uh, D. Fur told him to get Gene. Because Puff was saying he used to do these parties at the building called Unsigned Hype. And he used to do a party at the Red Zone called Daddy's House. But he had to take the money up to Kirk Burroughs. This was like 80, 89, or something like that. So I would be there with him, make sure I'd pick him up, ride with him, drop the money off and everything like that. So that's how I became security for him. And then I started giving parties and everything. So I was doing my own security, get hiring guys, uh, putting security teams together. So at the center, Sweet Honey and the Rock. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but it's a, a group of ladies. They sing, they sing, they sing spiritual, uh, Afrocentric uh, motherland songs. And they was coming to Corner Key Hall. 
and they needed security and a driver. And I did that for them one day. And I said, yo, I want to do this. So just working with Puff, working with the little, uh, the Cotton Club, different organizations and stuff like that, setting up their security, doing that. And then I got known. And then when Puff uh, left Uptown Records and he had that beef with Suge Knight after the City College incident and all that stuff like that, um, I came and Wolf, Wolf asked me would I uh, be a part of their team. And who is Wolf? Wolf was uh, security, Anthony Wolf Jones. He was security for Christopher Williams, Heavy D. He was doing, and he was a street entrepreneur with a crew called Butt Naked. And they were um, actually financing Bad Boy through the time. And they were doing their things in the street. Two of the guys actually went to jail and was convicted with nine nine sixteen of life sentences for distribution and cocaine trafficking. See the college game where nine people died and twenty six people were injured. How was that? That was crazy, man. And it was like um we had eighteen guys who were supposed to work outside. Puff had called me the day before that and say, Yo, Jay, we don't need those eighteen guys. We only need eight. I said, my man, you ain't going to, you're not going to secure eight, use eight people to secure the front. He said, no, Heavy D said, uh, we're going to use the FOI. I said, the FOI? He said, yeah, Gene. So I told my man, I said, yo, man, I'm not even going to do it. And then he told me, he said, uh, man, we just go ahead and do it. The stars are going to be there. And we just, uh, Puff said, we don't got to do the outside. Uh, we'll just do the gym. He said, we'll do the gym. I said, okay. Uh will secure the stars in the gym and so nobody would mess with the stars that were coming in. When I got there and seen the setup, I went to Puff directly. I said, yo, dog, some people gonna die at this damn door if they don't set this barricade and this shit up right. He was like, no, nah, Gene, just let them do it. Let them do it. Don't worry about it. Go to the gym and help the people in the gym. You know what I'm saying? Help the, you know, the stars that come in the gym and everything like that. So... Uh, all hell broke out. Mike Tyson, uh, uh, what's his name? LL Cool J. Yeah. You know, and they was the biggest stars back then, coming from New York. Mike Tyson and LL in the same place. My man, listen here. All hell broke out at that door, and then next thing you know, uh, when they burst through the burst through the glass door, and they start uh, rushing. Jessica Ro Rosenberg, I think Rosenberg, with the money, her and my, one of the guys I put security on, and they ran downstairs. But she shut the door on him and everybody else. And that's how the people start suffocating downstairs. The dude radioed me. He said, yo, Gene, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. His name, Eddie. Eddie is one of the guys. He's home now. He had this 17 years in the fed, fed joints for distribution of cocaine. So he's here to tell this story too. So he said, Gene, um, I can't breathe. I can't breathe, Gene. And then I ran around the gym, cut through the, uh, ran downstairs, cut through the basketball court while they were still playing the ball and lining up to do the layups and everything like that. And I pushed the door open and then people just start coming in. Then I pushed the other door open because the door only went inside. You could push, you had to push it from the inside. They lock from the outside. So I just pushed those doors open. People just start falling in. Then people was coming in. It was crazy. And uh, the one dude that I told him not to, to hold up, because he had nice and smooth, I was going to take them around the other way where the stars was coming in there. He said, no, I got him. He was laid on the floor dead. He was about 6'2", 300 and some pounds. He on the floor dead. So it was crazy, man. Because there was a girl pregnant as well, and she was yeah. pregnant. Yeah, uh, one of the girls that were pregnant, that was this this uh, rapper that we know as called Father MC. It was his girlfriend. You understand? Uh, this guy named Tone Wop and me and some other people got her out the glass door when they was bum rushing her. You know what I'm saying? At the top. We got her away. We was like, yo, ma, 
go home. This ain't the place for you. Turned around because, you know, everything that was going on, she snuck down the steps and they found her dead too. How do you deal with that, Gene? I never did. Um, it's crazy. I kept myself busy. I just was working, man. The 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 curb was my pillow. The street light was my lamp, and I just worked, man. I was I was going from one job. See, I was a parole officer, and parole at this time had the best job in the world because you made your own time. You had to do 37 and a half hours. So, you know, the the bosses to make let you make your own time. As long as you did what you were supposed to do. And you only had to be in the office one and a half days out the week. And that's when the guys came in for reports, your analysis, and you had to do what they call uh, 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 evaluation with your senior. So you can let them know what you're going to do the following week and y'all re- y'all make out your schedule. So that was great for me because I would go from that job to another job to another job. And then in between, I could go pick up my kids, you know, take them to school, come home from school from them and spend a little time with them and then do what I needed to do. See that incident at the college? See if there was 16 men. Do you think it could have been prevented? If it would have set up, yeah. See, what happens is that I learned what people was afraid of, right? What's that? Dogs. <laughs> so I'm, I'm telling you, I would set up a box in one, you know what I'm saying? And I had that box so far away from the door, you know, when the people are walking through, you understand, they just going straight in and people are searching them right then and there. And then I have a man with two dogs. I have two men. Each one of them have a dog. And they're keeping the line straight. That's the fear that they put it in, in us from the civil rights era. Mm-hmm. You understand? You have those dogs out there, and you make sure people will get in line and line up. They're not bum rushing the doors with no dogs. Did you ever have that conversation with Puff after that event? After that event, he didn't want to have that conversation. Even at the big, he didn't want to have that conversation. So, no, he didn't want to have that conversation. Because he was then fired from Uptown Records. Yes. And how was his life then? Because was he not suicidal at one point? Yeah, he was uh, D. Ferg. D. Ferg said, yo, man, we got to watch out for Puff because now he's become one of the same gang members. He's one of the members of our crew. So D. Ferg, who had a lot of love for him, said, yo, we got to watch out for dude, man. He talked about killing himself. And I was, I told D, like, on on a funny thing and I know it ain't funny I'll like, let his ass kill himself that's what he, <laughs> shit he don't listen no way <laughs> you know what I'm saying but I, I was being sarcastic about that old situation because being suicidal is not a funny thing and then he started Bad Boy Records well Bad Boy Records was actually started at Uptown and it was it was a promotion it was a they had a promotional deal you understand he was trying to he, he brought Big E he brought uh, Craig Mack and all them to Uptown, but they wasn't to let them doing anything. They had not made records or anything like that at the time. Mm-hmm. Missy, um, Missy Elliott, no, who's the girl? Who's the other woman? She's unbelievable. Mary J. Bly. Mary J. Bly, she's yeah. fucking amazing. So, because Puff was relatively unknown then, uh, nobody mm. really knew who the fuck he was. No. So when, how did his beef with Suge Knight start? Well... When he started getting into the record business, excuse me, when he started getting into the record business, and um, him and Suge was tight. They was boys. You know, he learning the business, Suge learning the business. You know, he starting Bad Boy and everything, Suge starting Death Row. They were puffer fly out to uh, California. Suge, Tupac, all of them, they were cool. This way before all this other bullshit went down. And I think that he wanted to have a, Suge Knight wanted to have a party. Or Suge Knight was giving a party. So he wanted Big and some bad boy artists or whatever like that at the time. And Puff was like, yo, let me get the door. You know, this is all what I'm hearing. This, I don't know how true this is. But this is what I was told about how him and Suge fell out. And I'm going to tell you why the beef really happened after that. So... 
Puff would not let his artists, Bingham, perform for free for Suge. Because Suge was getting money on the door in the whole nine yards. So I guess Suge fell out from him. That's the story I heard. But I know this for a fact. When Puff wasn't taking care of Misa and was shorting her on the child support or whatever like that, Misa started branching out to the West Coast artists and everything like that. Misa was his kid's mother, his, uh, his first child's mother, Justin Combs. And she started branching out. And when she went to California with Mary J. Blige and everything like that, she met up with Suge Knight. We seen this magazine, and the magazine had Suge and Misa in it. And Misa had Justin in her arms, and Suge was hugging Misa. And at the bottom, the caption wrote, what the East Coast won't take care of, the West Coast will. Right? That blew up. Then the Source Awards and all that other shit like that. That's how it went crazy. How ruthless was Suge? Because he just seemed fucking ruthless. He seemed crazy. But you're only crazy than the people that you have around you. I never thought Suge was that dude like that. Did you never see any of that side of him? I didn't I didn't see him like that. I saw him four times, and the four times I saw him, it was nothing. You know, it wasn't no stare down, no, no look, or nothing like that. You know, because nine times out of ten, you could tell by a man's eyes, and then you want to wear sunglasses. You ain't that dude if you got glasses on your face all the time, and you don't want nobody to see your eyes and see what you're really about. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So when I see a guy with glasses on, I'm at an advantage anyway, because I'm gonna hit you so hard, those glasses gonna, 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 gonna mess something up. You understand? So I never saw him as being that terrifying or anything like that to people, you know, to me. Because he was a, he was a, a bodyguard also, he was. Yeah. And then he ended up, I think, with NWA with Dre and right. Ice Cube and try to get himself involved with that, but he hmm. ended up with some of the biggest artists on the planet. Was that? Fear tactics, or was he, was he a good businessman? I think Suge was a great businessman because he came out and got Joe to see and Mary J. Blige out of some of the bull crap that Uptown Records were doing them where they wasn't getting no money, wasn't getting no points, no nothing that was owned to them. I think Suge, because he was an educator also, he go into college and, you know, I don't know if he got his degree or not, but he learned the business from somebody enough to know that there were points, you know what I'm saying, and things that were involved in the artist getting outside the regular advance that was owed to the artist, and he was letting these artists and these people know. So see the beef between Suge and Puff Daddy, do you think that's the reason why Tupac and um, Biggie then, because it was they were feeding them information? No. I think... Uh, Pac already knew what type of dude Puff was. And I, I believe that Pac was building Big up so Big could be a part of thug life. Because he told Big, you know, how Puff was. You understand what I'm saying? So I think because when Pac went to jail, uh, Big did not have any money to help him get out. But he was calling himself the king of New York and then, you know, they was had this persona that he had all his money, which he didn't. When did you first meet Biggie? Uh, I, I, I met, the first time I met Big was actually, I think at his platinum party. What was that like? That was crazy. See, for me, that's the greatest fucking era yeah. of hip hop, man. And, like, and I, that's it's, unbelievable. It's a picture that they had Big, and it said Big and his a uh, uh, hundred hype men on stage with him, and you could see me in the middle of all those people just looking at Big because Pig because Puff told me to watch him. You know what I mean? Uh, so that's the first time I I think I I, I met Big at his platinum party. Did you know how big? Oh, was... it's gold, gold, and everything. Like yeah, it got gold, juicy, and all like that. Did you know how big he was going to be? Well, no, not really. 
because I was running with Puff. And a lot of times Puff wasn't around Big. You understand what I'm saying? Because Big was doing his own thing with the Junior Mafia and the different people like that. So I, when Puff needed to go out of town or go someplace, uh, I would be with him. I think, let me see, it was probably at the Howard University campus when I met Big uh, and really chilled with him and had fun with him like that. That was probably the first time. And then that gold party was something later on. But I think it was at Howard University. Is that the bit that was in the movie when he oh. came out? Was that the bit that was in the movie when he was at the university? When I think he sang a bullshit and party? Yeah, I think so, yeah. How So see when you're meeting all these people, did you not have the incline that, okay, they're going to be as big I didn't know Big was going to be a star or felt that he was a star like that until his whole album was done and he was getting all these accolades and then we was on stage because I had so much going on in my own life. You understand? Yeah. When I wasn't bodyguarding Puff and them, you got to realize I was still a parole officer. I still ran complexes in New York. That was East Chester Housing. That was Lambert Housing that was Taino Towers. They were some of the baddest complexes uh, where people were living there where a lot of drugs was being sold in the whole nine yards. So I was still working with the cops, working with people, you know what I'm saying, to try to make their quality of life a lot better around there. So I didn't have time to really, okay, this guy's a star, this guy, this, that, and the third. But we were in Cincinnati. I swear for living God. Um, the Puff said, yo, Gene, I need you to be on stage with Big. So, so I went out on stage first. And Big and Lil C's was in the back, and they were doing this, this dance like uh, kid and play. You know when they do the, the they feet back and forth like that? I said, yo, this fat motherfucker could dance. <laughs> <laughs> yo, I was like, yo, this fat motherfucker could dance. He was doing that shit real good. I was like, damn. So then um, the song going, and then Big was back on the mic going, on the mic going, uh, 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 just, just making noise like that. And then he just came out, who the fuck is this? Paging me at 5.46 in the morning, crack of dawn, and I'm yawning. Yo, when he came out there, and I'm on stage. Yo, some shit hit me like this. And I mean like just the, the vibration from the audience and everything like that. And I was like, yo, this motherfucker is a star. He's a star. That's when I realized he was that big. See when Puff, because obviously he ended up involved in hip hop and doing his own stuff. Was he in? Was he writing his own music before he met Biggie or that? Or did, did he weren't involved once Biggie came into his life? Did he have any? Puff wasn't writing no music and nothing like that. Puff never wrote no music. He told you, I don't write music. I write checks. <laughs> yeah, because he ended up involved and like yeah. you say, on was it the Source Awards? Yeah. How was that when Shug went up on stage and says, "If you don't want your producer dancing in the video," that wasn't that. I didn't know anything about that. I wasn't there. They called me to go to the tunnel with them. You understand? You know what I'm saying? Kirk at Kirk Burroughs had called me, yo, Gene, Puff, won't you be at the tunnel? Because the tunnel is wild. Like, you know, it's like gladiator school. You know what I mean? You're going to fight. The uh, the bouncers are going to uh, rob you. <laughs> They're going to beat you up. So you got to have your stuff on the ball when you go to the tunnel. So we went to the tunnel. There wasn't no beef or nothing like that, you know. And then um, they had that little incident in uh, Atlanta, and I came on full back full time messing with them. What was the incident when you were with Puff and you seen Shug and Puff ran? Oh, that was at the Soul Train Awards. Tupac was alive then. Yeah. And what happened that night? Um... Uh, I think Big had, did Big perform? But Tupac was alive, yeah. Big had performed, right? Yeah, and he used my shoes. Uh, we were all in the locker room, and I'm, yeah, well, the, the, the dressing room and everything like that. And this is the story that K.O. Copeland stole from me 
and put it in the, the movie. movie. Yes, yeah. in that shoes that didn't fit. Yeah. Had to get shoes. Yeah. Was that your shoes? Those are my shoes. What happened was is that uh, Kale Copeland he had already wrote the book, and if that was an intricate part of the movie, why didn't he have it in his book? Because his book was a portrayal of the movie Notorious. You understand? So he said he wished he had to talk to me before, and I had told him that I was going to put that in my book because he was asking me, "Yo, what was some of the like, like the, like the craziest thing that happened to you and Big?" You know what I'm saying? So then I told him the part about the shoes. Uh, we were backstage and they had bought Big a size 12, right? And um, and him buying him a size 12, Big is a 14 E. You know, so why? I'm a 14D. You could squeeze in a 14D, but you can't squeeze in those 12D. So we sitting up there, and these people called 5001. They were doing all the clothes for all hip hop artists. Uh, Master P made them real famous, but uh, they had got them the wrong type of shoes. So Big was like, yo, F this. I'm going to do it Brooklyn style. I'm going out in my Tims. He had some yellow Tims on. He was going to go out there on stage. And Puff told the dude, say, yo, if he go out there on those stage with those Tims on, nigga, it's over. You ain't going to work. You ain't going to do this. I ain't paying y'all for shit. So they somebody say, yo, Gene, what size you were? I say 14. 14D. I had just bought these shoes. I still got them. They gave us from Maury's, $800, got them from Chavanates. So they were blue, and they go great with his suit. So then, so then uh, uh, they was like, yo, let Big wear them shoes. I, yo, man, what, what we got to give you? I said, make me an outfit, right? Shit that I never got. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, if anybody in the industry say they're going to do something for you, get your shit first. <laughs> get it first. Don't don't take their word. Their word ain't worth shit. You know what I'm saying? So um, Big used the shoes. He performed in the shoes. He got my shoes and so that me and Puff was watching. No, no. Was it me and Puff? No, no. Me, I was watching and I was sitting right behind, I think, Tamia. Grant Hill's wife. Oh my God. I could have got a charge right there. <laughs> my man. She was like, oh my God, you ever sat close to a woman and then her essence and everything, like the the perfume she had on, the way she looked, I was like, damn, he gotta be one of the luckiest men in the world. You know what I'm saying? So uh it was over with. Went backstage. Here you go, Big, sitting up there with my $800 shoes on, and he got, he's, he's leaning on the back of them like they flip flop. <laughs> I was like, yo, man, what the fuck is wrong with you? What the fuck? He's like, yo, D Rock, you ain't gonna be talking to me. Man, I'm gonna talk to your men. Man, give me my motherfucking shoes, man, like that. You know what I'm saying? So I got the shoes back, and, uh, when we got the shoes back, I kept the 12s anyway. <laughs> and uh, me and Puff were just making our rounds. Big them was leaving. So we hear on the microphone, there's an altercation at the front with Bad Boy and Death Row. So me and Puff jet, we start running towards that. When we running towards that, we get surrounded by a group of FOI mem members. You understand? And this one dude in his yellow suit is talking to Puff real greasy. So then I'm looking at this dude, and I and I got Puff like this, but I'm looking at this dude. He was telling Puff about some money, some and some type of situation. And I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And then next thing you know, Mustafa, who was Farrakhan's son, who's the captain of the FOI, who's over all the security and all the FOI members, you understand what I'm saying, that has to do with security, came over. And Puff said, yo, uh, Mustafa, would you talk to this brother for me right quick? And so Mustafa said, yo, brother. So the dude was still going at Mustafa hard. And then Mustafa said, yo, brother, 
in a calm voice again. And then the dude was, he didn't stop. I was like, yo, move stop and say, brother, and got up in his face like this. Then you see FOI members coming from everywhere. It was crazy. So we got up out of there and we started going to the door, to the front door. Um, as we go to the front door, now it's a corridor with steps that are coming up. So I guess Big and Tupac had just had their little altercation because I took an officer who was a parole officer out there with me, Bernard Brown. Uh, big, we call him Big Bunny. Um, six five, three hundred some pounds. We out there, and he said that uh, Tupac said, "West side, West side." And uh, Big told him, "Say, yo, I ain't scared of this motherfucking ass." But yet, and still, when they came out, one of Big's partner. Uh, uh, sorry about this. One of Big's partner, his name is, is a crip. His name is C Gutter. C Gutter pulls a gun on shit night. The whole crowd, FOIs, they stopped it and get in between of it. Big them get in their car and they leave. So they out front I see them Puff is behind me we walking that way now so uh, I was hugging myself you know cause I had to be real close to my girlfriends and I look back at Puff and I say Puff don't worry I got these cats bro ain't nothing gonna happen and he said didn't say anything. And then I looked back. He wasn't there. Then I looked that way. He had took off running and jumped down the corridor right in back of the TV vans. So I stood right there on the corridor because I wasn't jumping down that shit right there. And I put my back against the wall and shook them. They was coming up the steps and they just walked past us, walked past me and I seen Puff running in between the media vans. What do you think when a man does that, runs, obviously you're there to protect you, the security anyway, but when someone runs like that, do you lose respect for them? I wouldn't lose respect for him because that's his choice. And then it's actually was God sent because he saved me for doing something that I shouldn't have been doing in the first place and that I would have done with no problem. Would you have died for him? I would have died for him plenty of times. Just loyal to your job, loyal to what you were doing, um, or loyal to him? At one time, and people are gonna say I'm crazy for this, um, something came over me and said that Puff was making people's dreams come true, and I had to do whatever I had to do to save him so these people could have their dreams come true, because I knew what it was for somebody to take your dream. So I would have did anything to protect them at one time. Yeah, I can respect that, though, because back then as well, <clears throat> people's dreams were being made. I don't know if people were getting used and money took off them. I don't know the ins and outs. I was never there. But obviously you can read things in the press and go with what other people are saying. But people were living their dreams back then, no matter what you say about Puff. He like was changing lives. He was getting people off the streets. But even though people were making him, he was also making them. Would you agree with that? Well, you have to agree with that. But they didn't think that in the interim, their dreams coming true, they still was going to be broke. You understand? You know, to get somebody, if you played sports, to have people cheer for you by the thousands because you made a basket, you understand? Or you made a hit song. That, that kind of feeling, everybody is not privy to. You understand what I'm saying? Every not, everybody's not privileged of being on the stage, whether it's that of, of sports or that in music. You understand? When you have somebody that make that come true for you and your dream come true, but then your rent ain't paid and they driving in a Mercedes, it's kind of effed up. So he was making a part of their dream come true, 
but I don't believe they thought they was going to be hungry in the interim of that. Do you think that's lack of knowledge of getting money and, and buying the big watch and the big car but leaving your bills unpaid? Well, they're trying to live the high life but they've not really got the money to be doing so yet? Yeah, but regular people do that same yeah, shit no, too. Everybody does, everybody does that. Everybody you know what I'm saying? Regular yeah, yeah. people do that shit too, man. You know, it just ain't on the or musicians or the or athletes. Regular people do that shit too. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So after that, he runs away. Shug, how was the relationship between Biggie and Pac? Well, I spoke to Big at the Pac. Was Pac there then? At the Winnebago? Yeah. And Big tried to tell me that he didn't know why Pac was upset with him. But I knew why Pac was upset with him because he had signed with Puff and he had claimed to be something that he wasn't. So why does that upset him? Because like, if you supposed to be my man and you the king of New York and my girls gonna come to you for some money because I'm trying to get a lawyer to get out of jail for something I didn't do. If you're the king of New York and you getting these month, this all this money, why you can't help me when I helped you be the king? How much did Pac help Biggie? Well, you got to realize is that look at Big's flow. Look how Big was rapping before he got with Pac. Look at the party and bullshit, right? You understand? Big was not talking about I'm Big Papa. I uh, I've stayed coogee down to my socks, rings and watch filled with rocks. You understand? He took what you could call Tupac's uh, game plan. Money, cars, hoes, and bros. You know what I'm saying? and use that formula from party and bullshit. Do you understand? Use this formula and change it into, I'm Big Papa, I'm getting the money, I'm getting the hoes, I'm getting the cars, and I'm rocking the jewels. He used that formula. 1994 when Pat gets shot, I think at the recording studio, how did that change everything with everyone? Well, it, I guess it put people on alert that this could happen to you too. It should have let people know not to be involved with gang guys because I've been around people who spoke about that, Jamie Foxx and Ice Cube talked about it. When you bring um, gang, the gang faction and the people who live that gang life into your business like that, they have a whole different perspective about life than you do. They're, you know, they're living day by day and they'll kill you over color. And why did Pac, did, did T blame Biggie and Puff at the start or was that later on? Because we did get shot four or five times. Yeah, but uh, he didn't blame Biggie then because he actually knew Big ain't had nothing to do with it because the next day, Big went up there with this other guy that I know and got the gun out the piano. They went to the hospital. They wouldn't let Big see Pac, you understand? But they let Pac know Big ain't had nothing to do with it. He had the gun and whatever like that. I think he probably just used that as a method to bring attention to the labels and to sell records. Because Puffy's a businessman, he knows how to play the game. That's why he put out who shot you. Yeah, I was just about to say that, so who shot you, <laughs> but it's very, yeah. I understand it because of the shooting and how much traffic it would have got towards that, hmm. but not when it's friends involved, not when it's people don't really know, and then people would automatically go to, it must have been them who shot him. Mm -hmm. Like it's a very dangerous game, why, why play that game at all? You said it yourself, and I don't think I could say it any better than that. He's a businessman, and he know that's going to bring uh, countless and you can't even count the attention it's going to bring to the to the label, to the song, 
it, it was actually against LL Cool J. <laughs> Big was <laughs> Big was probably saying that against LL Cool J. You know what I'm saying? And uh, but Puff knew that people was gonna think it was gonna be from Tupac. He didn't like Tupac at all. You know why? I don't know. Jealousy. It's either jealousy or something went down between them two. I say this all the time that he wanted to, any girl that Pac was with, he had to have her. You understand? Um, and he got her. Got him. He, I, I really can't stay because I, I, I couldn't even tell you. I couldn't fathom to believe, you know, what was the reason why they hated each other so much. But after Pac was shot, we saw Pac up at Roseland. He had uh, this stuff in the uh, his in a sling. A dude lit a cigarette for him. He got a cigarette, put it in his mouth, and a dude lit it for him. I just started laughing. He was like, "Who kind of shit is this, man? <laughs> Lighting a cigarette?" <laughs> but then I forgot he was injured. You know what I mean? Yeah, but if he's going after all his ex girlfriends or whatever, that's a sign of jealousy. That's a sign of want to be him. Well, you, you know that to be true because the same thing that Pac said before, he said at the Grammy speech. When he got his Grammy, he said the same shit that Pac said. So, listen, I can't tell you the reason why, but there's certain actions you've seen, like when Pac was wearing the Fasati shirt, then Puff come out with the Fasati, same Fasati shirt that Pac had on. You know what I'm saying? I don't know, man. How did that change? Because obviously the East Coast, the West Coast, it kind of started a war. Did, did you see things change after yeah. that? Uh, security was heightened. Certain places that we had to go and we had to do, uh, you know, when you do rounds before you go to those places to make sure everything is straight. Uh Everybody wearing a bulletproof vest, you know. It was crazy. Uh, people going on on the alias, you know, staying at hotels on the alias names and stuff. How was it when Tupac released his diss track? Because that was ruthless. Obviously, you've got Ice Cube, you've got LL Cool J, who's done the diss tracks many years before, but that was up there as one of the most ruthless because, obviously... I fucked your bitch. Like, mm -hmm. how was that? Well, like I said, it didn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't bother me, but, uh, and I liked the song anyway. But um, I used to hear Big say, yo, next time somebody say something about me, I'm going to tear their ass up. So when I hear other people saying that Big didn't want to, your Big wanted to get back at Pac so bad that he he did it in a sneaky way, and I think that long kiss goodnight was his way of getting his revenge back on Pac. You know what I mean? Why did they not release a diss track in response? He did. If you look at long kiss goodnight, you think so? But but yeah, that's that's definitely talking about Pac. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but um, I think that he didn't do a, a diss track right at him like that was because that was something Puff was telling to him. You got to realize Puff owned his marketing and his publishing and Big wanted it back. So he listened to Puff more than he really wanted to. Was Puff in full control? Was he in full control? Somewhat. Well, they, as close as what the media make, the movies make, was Puff and Biggie close? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. Could Biggie have been getting used? He owns his marketing. He owns his publishing. No, still? Well, I think he sold it or whatever. He gave it to the Wallace family after he used it for so many years, but I don't know the circumstances of it now. But you got to realize... If you own somebody publishing and somebody marketing, you're going to get way more money than what you paid for. You know what I'm saying? So Biggie had no money? 
even after Jersey, even after the first album. He died broke, man. He ain't getting, he ain't, Biggie died broke. The money he got was from, I think, Life After Death album, but he didn't get a chance to see it. That's sad, that, isn't that, man? Yeah, it was crazy, man. It was just crazy just being with him that whole day and he telling me his dreams and telling me what he wanted to do and how he was going to do it. And it was crazy. And then to see none of that come true. See the hate between Biggie and Park the way, Park the way it ended up? Did that affect Biggie? Oh, yeah. He was affected by that crazy. You understand? Um, when he was telling me the story at, about he didn't have no money to help Pac with his his uh, legal trouble and everything like that. And he had to sell his publishing to Puff for about 200000 He also had just got a deal that he never got a chance to see for six, $62 million from Capitol and Atlantic Records, you know, with, with all the groups he had. He didn't get a chance to even sign the documents to say I agree to this and everything. Because he, he wrote he wrote everybody's music, did he not? Yeah. Yes, he did. He said Lil' Kim used to write too. Lil' Kim could write, but you know, he gonna make sure everything right. He wrote Lil' C's down that whole album and then he sourced it out to Mace, Cameron, probably some other rappers and everything like that. How was Faith Evans? How was she? I didn't I wasn't around Faith uh, only a couple of times. You know, I wasn't around her that much. Did you see the change in Puff from when you first met him to a few years later when he kind of became one of the top boys in that no industry? Doubt. No doubt. Does money no and doubt. fame change people a lot? Oh, come on. Why wouldn't it? <laughs> you understand? Know it change your address. <laughs> change the car you drive. The watch you have on. <laughs> she, it, it, you know, so there's very few people that don't change, but it's how you change that's important. Do you see a lot of people, more people change for the worst than actually the better? I seen that the people who was never used to anything and the time that they get it, they've changed for the worst. So Tupac was in prison. He reached out to Biggie to see if he could bail him out and that's where the... I don't think Tupac reached out per se, but Jasmine Guy and uh, Jada... And somebody else, it was another young lady that was collecting money for him, trying to uh, get the money up for his release. Was Biggie too embarrassed to say that he had no money? He didn't have it. You know what I'm saying? Did he they know that though, no? Uh, well, he had something that was better than money, but people wouldn't allow him to use his talent to do a fundraiser for Pac. You understand? Because the news would have been like he doing a fundraiser for a rapist. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So You can understand that as well, though. No matter if Park says he's innocent, it's for the business side of things. If he was guilty, then it doesn't look business for you. Like you say, you're supporting a rapist. So mm -hmm. you can understand it on a business side, but if that's your friend, you've got to stay loyal and stay behind them 100%, no, no matter doubt. what anybody says. No doubt. So he gets shot, the beef is very heightened. Then Pox, Pac's in Vegas. When Pac gets, when Pac, Pac, Tupac gets shot again, what's, what are you thinking? Well, we got a call that night. The night Pac got shot. And they say, yo, this guy named Daddy told us that, yo, they rolled up on him and they got them, they, they got them guys, they got them, they got them like that. And I was like, oh shit. You know, so he said, we'll tell you when we get back. I never said this to nobody. Nobody gonna ever believe it. And I, I was told this, that it wasn't only a driver that killed, two, that shot Tupac, or if it was a driver who shot Tupac. You know, you hear a lot of stories like, I thought it was Dre, I thought they was in the car, but then I also thought, because I was told by somebody who was there, that somebody ran on the, up up on the car and shot Tupac. And I never told nobody, I told three or four people, but I never let them release that 
to anybody or tell, you know, you can't tell nobody that. You understand like that? And then one of the person I told was a female, she said, shouldn't I told her the same thing? Why is the whole thing been so messy? Why the, you're, you're shot in the middle of fucking Vegas, you, but why is it been shot? Obviously you get your conspiracy theorist and rightly so, because it is a bit, it's very strange for someone to get killed. Yeah. At that time, in front of so many people, but yet no one was ever convicted. I know, is it Orlando Anderson? Right. Um, and I think, who's the guy? Is it Keefy D? Keefy D, Dre. He seems to be off of you. Why would you sit in a podcast and admit shit that you've done? Like, it just seems very messy. I think that, you know, on, on Keefy D behalf, is that um, he had officers that released that information. And they wasn't supposed to release that information to nobody. And they did it. And because he was selling books. And you got to realize this guy was one of the top drug dealers in the, one of the top drug dealers on the West Coast. You know what I'm saying? He doing 100 keys a week or better. You know what I'm saying? So if he's doing all those type of, you know, he's selling all those type of drugs. And then he gets to the point where as he go to jail, he come out, and he's not doing that well. He used that method to sell his book now. This cop already put that information out. I'm going to go with it. I know I didn't do it. Because he, did he not sign something in the police station that would keep him out? Well, this is a Vegas case. Yeah. This is California talking that stuff. You understand what I'm saying? California can't give me nothing to stop me from going to jail in Vegas <laughs> if Vegas want me and Vegas have evidence against me. I think all of it is just circumstances and hearsay. When was it Puff ran in and said somebody needs to die? He says Pac needs, needs, he says Pac needs to die, Biggie needs to die, or... Oh, so, that's the night we, he ran. <laughs> but why, say, why shout Biggie needs to die? Yo... I still cannot tell you to this day why he said Big need to die. I can only tell you what I think. You understand? I think that Big was robbing Pac. I mean, Big was robbing Puff like Puff had taken from Big. He took his marketing, which was legal. He may not have known how important it was. He took his publishing, which was legal. He may not know how important his publishing was. You understand? Taking those things upset Big, because Big found out how important those things were him to move on. Because like I told you, he got that $62 million deal, you know? So now, Puff found out that Big was writing all those things. And what was he not doing? He wasn't putting it in his name. He was putting it in Tatiana, his daughter, and other people's name. Letting Lil' Kim still keeping the credits for those songs and shit. So now, who gets mad? Puff gets mad. He gets upset. I gave you 200000 and now I can't get my money back because you writing this stuff for people, but you ain't saying you write it? All right. I don't give a fuck if Pac got to die. I don't give a fuck if Big got to die. Shouldn't I can go to jail? He's fed up. Because that's not friends then. Understand the business side of things. Puff's a, a businessman, 100%. But if that's your friend and you're taking his rights to his music, there's no loyalty there. He should be teaching him. They two have come up together. He should, well, he's never, Puff started before him, but he should be educating him how to make more, what to do. He did. Big told me. Big said, I can't be mad at him. He taught me how to get money. Who was Big doing it to? Little C's, Junior Mafia, and Little Kim. Doing it to each other. 
Yeah. <laughs> it just seems a fucking ruthless industry where everybody's yes, sir. fucking everybody. Right. But it just seems strange. Could Puff have been involved in Tupac's murder or Becky's murder? I think that when you set up an atmosphere for something to happen, how involved are you? You set up the atmosphere. You put people in positions to get hurt. He knew that somebody was going to do something. He was told. I told him before we left. I told him. Mace told him. See, people ain't telling. See, everybody think that Gene Deal is the only one know this shit. I'm not the only one that's noticed and privileged to this information. I'm the only one that's speaking on it and has spoke on it. Now people are coming out gradually, but when Puff set up an atmosphere for somebody to get hurt and they get hurt, don't you take some responsibility for that? Is that more tactics? He's not going to pull the trigger. He might not even pay someone to do so, but like releasing that song, Who Shot Yeah, that creates an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. creating certain things and planting seeds in, in somebody else's mind to be number one where Tupac ends up getting killed Biggie ends up being killed who becomes number one? Mm. P. Diddy Puff Daddy could that have been tactics for then to take off the people who were competition for him to take it all? or is that a bit far-fetched? Well I'm trying to believe that he's not that bright <laughs> <laughs> but Anything's possible. But he's not fucking stupid. No, he's not. If you don't get to the position that he are is being stupid, you can just listen to other people and listen to what people are saying. Because somebody told that. Somebody told Puff, Pac gotta die, Big gotta die. And shit not gonna go to jail. You know, these people planned 25 years in advance. Had Pac and Big still been alive today, Come on, brother. You and I both know how strong they would have been. How heartbreaking is that to see two men at the height of their powers, just still young kids. People would forget they're only in their 20s. What were they, 24, 26? Yeah. Like two young boys, unbelievable talent. Um, two packs. Listen, I still listen to both albums. I still listen to both their albums to this day. As their stuff is timeless. It's unbelievable for young kids to them be getting used against each other. That's how big they were, because it did basically start a war in-house, but it's sad to think that they've been played. It's sad to think that people have made them go against each other, make them fight each other. For who's gain? Somebody's gaining, but it ain't fucking them. Right. But the crazy part of it is, is that, and I look back and I see that the people that were close to be and how... They were like Judas after all he had did for them and put them in a position to be where they are. How they, how it only took 30 pieces of silver to get them to be traitors against them. Does that upset you? It upset me a lot. Tell the truth, come out. Let people know like, I used to blame myself. I used to blame myself. I went through years, man, blaming myself because I went to that party with them. Puff said, yo, Gene, you ain't gotta go. I said, man, somebody gonna kill us tonight. I sat at a table and told all the guys that was around her, they coming to kill us tonight. And D-Max said, yo, we lock and load together. We lock and load together. I don't see nobody locking and loading nothing. I went to Puff prior to telling those guys. I went up there. Puff sat at the top of the steps. I'm looking up at Puff. Mm -hmm. I said, yo, Puff, I got some intel. He said, what's up, Gene? Kim come right on the side of him. She's in a white robe. Puff is in a white robe. His wife robe says B.H. because he had took it from Beverly Hills Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to him, I said, yo, my man, I'm looking at him, I said, 
my man, I got some intel. These guys are coming to kill us tonight at the party. Yo, Gene, you ain't got to go. I'm the only one that got, I'm the only one that got it with them. You know what I mean? I'm the only one that could distribute it if I need to. But you tell me I don't have to go? I felt that small. I go in, I call my man, Slick. Shay pick up the phone, Sean pick up the phone from the block. Because back in New York City, we used to have pay phones. So I use Andre Harrell number. If you go by his number on that day, you'll see I called uh, 12th Street because that's a phone record. It's still there. You understand? That would be as long as they got phone records, they could go back and look at Andre Harrell house number and see on March the 8th before March 9th, I called 112th Street and 8th Avenue pay phone. I said, yo, Slick. I spoke to certain people. They told me that these guys are coming to kill us tonight. He said, I said, yo, Puff said I ain't got to go. Slick a gangster. He said, don't go there. Fuck them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I said, I can't do them kids like that. I can't do these kids like that, man. He said, yo, man, listen here. All I'm saying, if something happened to you, he going to have somebody to answer to when he get back here. He said, yo, listen here. Slick told me always, you know, Failure to prepare is preparing to fail. Don't nothing beat an ambush. Failure to prepare is preparing to fail. Don't nothing beat an ambush. That means keep your head on the swivel. See that night then? See when he's telling you not to be there? Could he have potentially been involved? Like I said, if you set up an atmosphere, you're just as much as wrong. It's crazy how we come out of party. We used to jump in the car. We gone. We waited. We waited. But see, when I spoke to the FBI and I spoke to people, they led me to believe that there were more than one or two people that was trying to kill us out there that night. Those those guys who wanted, see, I believe it was those guys who wanted to get back at Big for that ambush over in Red Hook when their van got shot up. Because those are the guys who told Mace that Puff and Big had to worry about something. So Puff may have made a phone call to them. You understand? Saying, yo, listen here, man. I ain't have shit to do with that shit that happened in Red Hook. Big gonna be at the party. Y'all could talk to him then. He could have done that. Because Mace didn't come to the party either. But Mace knew about that because Mace told me about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The guys he played ball with, they were the Crips and stuff like that. I think they were um, those guys called uh, the Dog Pound. Right. So they have told Mace you good, Mace, but Puff and Big ain't. So I know Mace told Puff. Mace didn't tell Big. You understand? So I know what Puff is going to do. He's going to make a phone call to those guys and say, yo, man, listen here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to exonerate myself. I ain't had shit to do with that. You hear me? We going to this party the party that I tried to talk them out of going, the vibe party. Now, I blamed myself for years, as I said, until I heard the president of Motown, the former president of Motown, or vice president of Motown, Clark Kent, and Un Rivera, Biggie's partner, say these things. Un Rivera said, I had called Karen Hunter and I think Janet Jackley. They was going to meet Big to the hotel before he went to London. Supposed to be going to London. Your neck of the woods. Mm -hmm. he, they were supposed to be meeting him. Clark Kent said, I was in Big's hotel and I asked him 
what are you doing tonight? He said, I'm going to this party that D-Rock, his man, and Puff set me set up for me to go. He told Clark Kent that. Clark Kent on the Art of Dialogue said that shit. Yo, when Clark Kent said that shit, my man, all the pain that I had inside me, everything that fucked me up for years, because that kid died there, all that shit came out of me. I used to blame my fucking self. Do you understand what I'm saying? I used to blame myself. So when I heard Clark Kent say that, that he told Big not to go, it's nothing I could have fucking said to that kid. Because when I looked at him, I said, yo, Big, they coming to kill us tonight. Lil C's, he hadn't been around for a whole week. Go ahead with our old cop shit, Gene. You understand? But they don't know throughout the years that the shit that was on me every time I hear this kid music, every time I hear, because I knew God put me there. You understand? God put me there. But I had the wrong principle. I had puff. So when we got when we got to that light, instead of stopping at the light, as soon as I got in the car, Kenny, run the next three lights. Run the next three lights, Kenny. We jet through the light. The killer was right there at the light. He had just walked up to me less than five minutes prior to killing the notorious big. Do you understand? He was right there at the light parked. It wasn't no drive by. Don't listen to these people. It was no drive by. The guy was parked in the car. When Big stopped at the light, he pulled out the parking space, bow, 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 turned the corner. So you were told to drive through the light? I told our driver to drive through the light. And, yo, like when I was telling uh, Steve, Steve, right? I told Steve, I said, yo, Steve, Steve said, uh, well, you have law enforcement, is you part of the military? I said, no. Uh, my job as being a New York State parole officer, we trained with a lot of agencies, different agencies. They gave courses and everything like that. And this is how good God is. Two weeks prior to going to California, I took a class called interrogation and surveillance. And in that class, we had to learn how to interrogate somebody. We had to learn how to do certain surveillance. We had to learn, and they taught us tricks where you could find out somebody following you. And in that, uh, in that course, it said, take three lights, run three right. Make, make three rights, take three lights. You understand? If you take three rights, where are you at? Back to where you started. Right where you started. And if that motherfucker car is right behind you, yeah. if that car is behind you, somebody following you. Mm-hmm. If you run three lights and that person run those same three lights that you ran, somebody's following you. So I just, some, when I got in the car, because I wanted to ride on the side of the car. Back then, back then I'm 265. Right now I'm 320. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so I wanted to ride on the side of the car with my gun out. Like as if you were fucking watching the president? Yeah. I would have been the first one to have been shot. But everything you've said, Gene, even listening to your story, you talk about the college night. You said people are going to die. You said to big somebody's going to die. Did you have a, did you have a feeling? As, are you connected to something where you feel that something's going to go wrong? Or do you always think that way? Nothing be the ambush, bro. And I don't always think that way. That's so it wasn't that's paranoia like you're saying that shit every day where eventually you're going to get one out of every hundred, right? If you have people with street knowledge and gangsters, Chaz told me, yo, they coming at y'all. You understand? 
a dude from that was hanging with Jodeci. Yo, we ain't going to the party, bro. It's gonna be some bullshit. You understand what I'm saying? It don't take a rocket scientist. You understand what I'm saying? Uh-huh. To see something and know that something's gonna happen. And it's a possibility. Why wasn't he more protected? Because Puff wouldn't pay for security. I told Kirk Burroughs, man, we need more security, bro. How the hell you just got me, Kenny, for Puff, and you got Paul and somebody for Big, but all of them, they got entourage, they got other people. Come on, bro. See when Biggie, Four people. See when Biggie dies, does that enhance Puff's stock with the, 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 the rights he's got from Biggie's music? Oh, come on. So 10 million. He sold 10 million. Big got like 7 million out of a uh, 10 million album. Yo, if you sell 10 million albums, right, that's about 20, $200 million. $180 million, something like that. You know, you, you know what I mean? Because the Michael Jackson thing as well, because I think Sony owed him over a billion in his rights, and he had the Beatles rights. I think he had Eminem's rights. Obviously, he can get a conspiracy theories, but if he's gone, they get the rights back. Right. You're talk- people kill each other for fucking ten dollars. Right. Never mind a hundred million, a billion. Ain't no, ain't no, ain't no. Uh, man, Michael Jackson was. We know that dude was paid to murk him. No, allegedly. Our God said allegedly, but there's no way, man. That doctor don't know what he's doing, and Michael Jackson just go up and just die like that, man. He on he. Not only that. What about the Marvel thing? He had made the deals were making a deal with Marvel Comic. It's a lot of stuff that was going on with Michael Jack. Yeah. yeah. Does it do you question a lot? Because that life it seems glamorous, but I interview enough people now to realize how fucked up it was, and no trust, no love. Everybody's out for themselves. Everybody would fuck you over. Everybody would fuck your woman. Like, like what the fuck is that all about? But now that's their, that's the mentality. That's what that game is about. You understand? I used to see Puff run through so many girls, but if he ain't had a dime, he wouldn't be able to do that. I used to see him run through dudes that he was smiling their face and then F their girls. That's not a nice person. I don't think about a nice person, but that's not. <laughs> yeah, but it's not. <laughs> that's really. a fucked up dude. Yeah, man. that's not loyalty. Yeah. There's no. Love there, they just seems yeah. fucked up. And, and the woman is fucked up as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you were there when Biggie gets shot. What happens then? Um, me and Tone jump in the car and we chase, try to chase the driver, but we couldn't get close enough to do anything. So I said, Tone, let's go back and set up a... a I said, Tone, we got to get back. You know what I'm saying? So we could set up, well, when the pop cops come, they could take Big to the hospital, whatever like that. So when we get back, uh, Puff was like, yo, Kenny, you know where the hospital at? And Kenny said yes, and we drive Big to the hospital. Because you had them in your arms, is that correct? Yeah, that's when we got them to the hospital. We got them to the hospital, uh, which it took us a long time to get there, man. I don't know, shit. He took a half an hour to get to some place that was actually two blocks away. And Kenny's from California, so he'd never been asked about that one. Uh, seen the sign that I think was two blocks away, and we went someplace else, or vice versa. It was a hospital two blocks away, and we ended up going, you know, about a half an hour away from the scene. Was he still alive at that moment? Well, I don't know. Uh, the last thing I heard Big say was just do it. Kenny said, I'm going to get you to the hospital, Big. And Big said, just do it. And then I told people, don't let them go to sleep. Whatever you do, don't let them go to sleep. Keep them up. Don't let them go to sleep. When we got to the hospital, we somebody ran into the hospital. They got a gurney, and we pulled them out. And when we pulled out the, pulled the body out, that's when I seen his pants was... Uh, saturated, appeared to be urine, and I could smell uh, the feces. And I just, when I grabbed him, 
and then I just dropped his leg. And they looked at me, they said, yo, Gene. And I was like, and I just grabbed him up and we put him on the gurney. You know, that was like 400 pounds of dead weight, man. So put him up on the gurney. And then they rolled him in there and Paul looked at me. I said, yo, man, that nigga dead. Excuse me. I said, yo, that brother's dead. And he said, uh, no, nah, he just, it was shock, Gene. It was shock, bro. You know, he was just shocked. He just been shot. He, he ain't dead. I say, bro, he dead. He pissed the shit on himself. And then uh, start getting phone calls from everywhere. I'm making phone calls. How do you go over that, Gene? Because you you seem to have seen a lot of pain and death in your life as well. Like I said, uh, I just kept myself busy. I had to raise three daughters. Um, I never had much of nothing. I was everything I got. I worked for, you know what I'm saying. And I don't mean nobody had to give me nothing, you know what I'm saying. But I, I wanted to have a different life. So, at one time, I was putting it all into my work. Uh, I write poetry. Um, I was out to help people. So. I use my ability to help somebody change their life. You know, so being a parole officer is not just, yo, pissing this cup or what time you gonna be at home and all that. It has a lot to do with uh, how could I help you change your life to change your family life so they could be proud of you and you could be proud of yourself. So. I put all my energy in doing that. And what happened after Biggie get killed? How was life then? How was life when Biggie get killed after? Oh, it was it was it was terrible. You know, vand my car being vandalized. You know, people wouldn't run up on me. I ain't the one you want to run up on. You know, what I'm saying at that time, I was still, I still had this, like. I would really fuck you up type of attitude. You know what I'm saying? So you're not coming with me with no crazy shit. So if you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, of course. Um, but but the vandalism of my house, you know, of, of my cars and shit like that, it was like, it, that shit was crazy. Did you get blamed for it? Oh. Because you, did you get blamed for it because you were the security guard? Oh yeah, Puffnum tried to, you know, I was secure. I was Puff principal. Puff was my principal, but they tried to throw it off like uh, I had. It was my fault. I was. I didn't shoot. I didn't do this, and I didn't do that. And then the FBI told Puff himself. He said, "You alive because of Gene." Phil Carson told him himself, "You alive because of Gene." Because had you stopped at that light, that would have been you. Had you not run that light, that would have been you. That's what they thought because those were the fashion. I think those people was there to kill Puff, but they killed Big instead. But those other guys from I, the Dog Pound, they wanted Big also. So that's how they were saying that there was more than one, two people that was out trying to kill us. Plus Puff had that beef in Soul Train with the Muslim people too. So... Wherever it was coming from, I think that that was something professional that was done. Why do you think Puff's still alive? Because the attention now, after Big's death, they had no reason to come at him. They had no reason to come after that. Because the, uh, the Keefy, Keefy D say that Puff paid him to kill Tupac or was he just saying that bro I, 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 I can't believe that only because of this I've been around Keefe D and Puff when they were gambling I mean 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars in the pot or more or more and Keefe D lost 
And not one time he was like, yo, pup, let me get 20 of that OU. You know, let me get 20 of that that you owe me. Because that's what somebody would say. And we probably wouldn't know what he was talking about, but not one time I've been around him that Keefe D tried to get money from him. So Keefe D and Puff were friends? Yeah, they was cool. But Keefe D was there when Tupac get shot? That's what he said. But it does, it does put a lot of question marks over Puff Daddy's got question marks over, especially now. So, but with the stories that are coming out, we fucking it seems like a very dark individual where he would do anything just to keep his own career on track. But would I be right in saying that? Yeah, I I, I wouldn't uh, disagree with that. I wouldn't disagree with that. That's a scary place to be, though. Everybody can be fucked over, three hundred buses. He wouldn't have cared if you got a bullet in the head. I know. Biggie got a bullet in the head. I know. And I don't know the guy, so I'm only saying from what I'm hearing, but something doesn't sit right with him. Mm -hmm. Who So who killed Biggie then? Because no one was ever convicted. I believe Amir Muhammad will sit there to probably kill Puff, but he killed Big. Big was a casualty of war. And that he was given the okay. It's just how it happened. You know, me being uh, an officer and being somebody who'd been around that type of situation and those things, when we blew that light, that man could have shot right then and there as we was blowing the light. He could have shot big all right there. It seemed like he was given permission. You understand the weight, the time, you understand? Yo, they blew the light. Damn. But big them right here. Well, go ahead and shoot him. Fuck it. Bap, 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 bap. Get it? The time that it happened, it wasn't spontaneous. Spontaneous would have been we blow the light. Bap, 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 bap. Not we get across the street, we wait for them. And then we see the shots go out. Why doesn't the car follow? I don't know. I don't know. There were three girls on the sidewalk and I found out they were talking to those three girls. So what happens with your life after that then? How how was the relationship with Puff? Uh, I stopped, we stopped dealing with each other for a minute. And then about a year later, I seen him up at the Super Bowl or whatever, he said, yo, uh, Wolf, I said, yo, Gene, come here. I said, what's up, man? He said, yo, uh, come in the back. They was in the back of Puff. Uh, yeah, Justin's too in Atlanta. He said, yo, Puff, put Gene back to work. Then Puff said, yo, Gene, you want to come back to work? I said, I don't care. What's up? And he said, uh, see me in my office on Monday. I came to his office on Monday. And I went back to work for him. What sort of stuff were you doing then? Same shit, babysitting. <laughs> uh -huh. Babysitting his ass, making sure he, uh, like right now, he's strung out on pills. So just making sure he's good. But I only, I only had him on uh, sometimes Friday, but Saturday and Sunday was my day, but sometimes I have him Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And what sort of stuff would you do? Just a regular. he go into meetings. MTV shows, because now he's the star. You know, he's the man. Did you see another big change when everyone was gone? Yeah, I seen a change. I start, yeah, I think it was, it had a lot to do with the drugs too. You know, now he popping pills. Puff was never no smoker, no nothing, nothing like that, but now he's popping pills. And, uh, and, He's just going crazy with the women. But what about all the gay shit when people are saying he's fucking gay? And well, listen here, man. I'm not the type of dude. They they live a rock star life. I'm not going to be in a in a room with another man, and whether it's two women or a thousand women, I'm not going to do that. That's not me. I don't. I'm not ashamed of anything. That's just ain't. That's ain't how I do my thing. 
So um, only time that I could see something like that is the places we used to go, those Turkish baths. <laughs> <laughs> I used to go in there, and it would be nothing but men in there. And I'd be like, yo, I'd go to the door with them, and then next thing I'd turn back around and go out, and never a bunch of naked men in there. The fuck is this all about? So whatever he used to do in those days, that's that's what he did. Yeah, no one gives a fuck if you're gay, straight, or bi, but when you're portraying yourself as a bad boy and fucking all these girls, but then fucking men, it just don't sit right with me. It just seems strange. But again, it's 2024. I don't know what's... <laughs> They're going to be marching on you, English. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do you know what I'm saying? I don't care what the fuck you do, but it's, um, it's obviously... How was Cassie? Because obviously all the stuff out now when he's saying he used to get men to fuck her and stuff like... Yeah, that was that was after me, man. I, yeah, but for I me, left. Yeah, it's just... If that's not right. Men are protectors. You should right. be protecting women. If you love a woman, you shouldn't be able to fucking handle it if a man's looking your missus up and down, never mind fucking her. Like, that's that's, that's your woman and all yeah, that. That's crazy. That's man. deranged thinking for me. Yeah. So if everything that's true about what people are saying, then he sounds like a fucking nasty bastard. Oh, that's possible. A bro. sick man, do you know what I'm saying? And it just seems all strange. Like, I don't know, man. But, but see, they get that. See, that's been going along for a long time. He gets it from Russell Simmons, Andre Harrell. They teaching him that. You know, Puff wasn't that type of dude. Where would he learn that from? You understand what I'm saying? So now, you know, the student has became the teacher. What do you think the outcome will be with them with all these rape allegations and? Well, what they would do is is that they're gonna try to, you know, that's why they want to know the names of the people because the DA in them is not filing anything against them. You understand? That means the state takes on those problems. You understand? You have, uh, the women that's doing it and the lawyers. You know what I'm saying? He's not be bringing up on criminal charges. Those charges are basically, you know, for uh, uh, for judicial reasons. You understand? So until the state takes one of those charges and say, yo, yo, he did this and he did that, um, he's going to pay his way out of it. Do you think there became a time where he felt untouchable? Oh, yeah, he knew he was untouchable. He felt like he was untouchable. You, 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 you could see that. What about J-Lo? Did, she, did you ever meet her? Oh, yeah, yeah. Was that the night, that, remember the night that there was a shootout in a nightclub? Yeah, 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 yeah. What was J-Lo like? Uh, I used to call her Miss Miss Lopez. I think that she was just remarkable. She was a beautiful, not only beautiful, she just, like, If you was in the business like that, you want that to be your woman. You know what I'm saying? She represented you well. Now, I don't know how she is now, but, you know, she represented Puff well. You know what I'm saying? He ain't had to worry about nobody um, trying to come at her a certain kind of way. She had been in the business long enough to know she was well-respected. She could get us in places, man. We was down on the field at the NFL. We was down on the field with the uh, um, the My- Miami Hurricanes, all that stuff like that. Yo, she was the ball. You know what I mean like that? If if you were a superstar or you was into that business, you would want that to be your woman. Was there much of violence from Puffy with his exes and girlfriends back then? Did you see much of domestic abuse? Um, only time I seen him with, with, with Kim, you know what I mean? Um, nobody else. A lot of people around him as well. A lot of people seem to die. Why do you think that is? Well, the thing about it is, is this, is that I think that how he lives his life and how he cares about people 
put them in precarious situations that they can lose their life if they're not careful. And uh, I really don't believe that Kim had pneumonia, just like the rest of us, because I was aware prior to her going to California, her lifestyle, you know what I mean? And, and the things that she did with Puff. And when you do certain things, uh, you put your life in danger. What sort of stuff? You know, drugs. You know, drugs, drinking and drugs and stuff like that. A lot of people do that shit. You know what I'm saying? And it wasn't just smoking weed. You know what I mean? So when you put yourself in that type of situation, you know, and you round somebody, it's like Lynn Bias. Do you know who Lynn Bias yeah. is? Lynn Bias was a hell of an athlete, right? Mm -hmm. Probably would have been as good as Larry Bird, maybe as good as Jordan. We would have been known to him. Lynn Bias was using cocaine prior to the night he became um, the number one draft pick for Boston Celtics. Just picture this. We knew the guy who used to play on Maryland team. He was from Tennessee. He used to tell us he had to piss for the whole team damn there. You understand? He had to piss for the whole team damn there. Lynn Bias is used to a certain kind of cocaine, right? Because he was getting that type of money. Now he's about to get NBA money. He step up his game and get a whole different type of cocaine, like a better type of cocaine. And what happened, what happened to him? He dies from it. When you're in certain positions, you understand? You cannot, you know, like, my money ain't like somebody who's, you know, just say, I'm bodyguard Puff. Okay, cool. But somebody who's bodyguarding Rockefeller, they gonna get twice as much as I get. You understand what I'm saying? Right. So their money is different. So when you got that different money, you get those different type of drugs. Michael Jackson went to Houston. Yeah. And what happened? What happens then after you leave Puff? How was life then? Oh, you know, like, I had things going on. I had K. Slay. I was bodyguard Scott Storch. I went to bodyguard Scott Storch. I went. I was bodyguarding K. Slay. How's 50? Uh, 50 was dealing with black hands. Mm -hmm. And uh, 50 came over to my house when they were setting him up. To, uh, he knew they was going to set him up and try to kill him. And I tried to give him a bulletproof vest. And I told 50 that he had to watch out behind that shit. So um, I never spoke to him. I spoke to him again with Scott Storch when he was doing the candy shop. That's on the candy shop. Mm. And he, he sat me down. We was, we was in there talking. And he was I was, I was trying to say that I would, because I would have rolled, I would have rolled with 50. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And he knew that. But because of his introduction to by Chaz Williams, who he had a problem with, he had a problem with, then he told me, he said, yo, I couldn't trust anybody. I had to deal with the people that I was dealing with who came in the game with me and everybody else. I had to let go. I couldn't F with them. And that's understandable. You understand? I was telling them, yeah, I'm, a, I'm my own man. I've always been my own man. And he was like, yeah, I know, Gene, but I had to do what I had to do for me. I like 50. seems a decent guy. His book was unbelievable. Yeah. I thought it was amazing for what he's came from to what he's overcome to what he's doing now. He always takes a shot at Puff. Yeah. Why? I think because Puff was robbing him on that publishing thing. 50 was doing a lot of writing for a lot of people back then before he was even known like that. He was writing music. A lot of these cats have written a lot of songs for people and never will get the publishing because they put their publishing in somebody else's name. Here go 10,000. All right, write that. That song become a hit. My name is on the publishing. 
Yeah. You hear what 50 tell, 50 tell the story? His album sold 10 million, right? He asked the, he told the producer, keep the 50,000. I'm gonna give you one point. That one point would've got that dude $1 million. And they rejected that. Huh? They rejected that. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. So that's what it's all about is points. The more points, the more money. Yeah. Yeah. What's your whole rundown on it, Gene? What's your whole rundown on the big A two-pack scenario, Puff Daddy scenario? What's the whole rundown of why you think they all died? Who was involved? Well, I know the atmosphere was set up for Big to die in California. You cannot make me believe that you know that Tupac had just died six months, six months before Big died. You're gonna plan for him to be out in California to promote anything. You're only getting 20% of your sales from out there anyway. And you could do radio to the DJs over the radio, and they understand that, your circumstances, your situation. And then Big, if you would have told him to run because your life depended on him, he could not run because he had broken both of the fibrillar bones in his thighs from the car accident. So he was in a wheelchair most of the time. So because of the Soul Train Awards show, you're going to send your man to California and then have him out there still for a month or two knowing that he got a beef with some people out here that are gang members. He got his own beef out here. So my take on Big, he was put in a position to be somewhere to be handled. But then Puff had hurt some people and they was trying to handle him and Big took that L for Puff. If you get what I'm saying. To clear his name and put him, yeah. take him, leave me. Yeah. What's your biggest regret in life, Gene? My biggest regret in life? Yeah. Not having to spend more time with my kids. Running around the country with artists and this music shit. And even though I provided for my kids more than I ever was, I could have spent more time with them. Why were you so invested into that life? Because I think that I grew up always wanting to beat up the bully. What's your opinion on Puff now? Well, my opinion would be that some way, somehow, God even evens up the playing field. No matter what kind of watch you got, no matter what kind of car you drive, no matter what kind of house you live in, God evens up the playing field. You just got to be ready to play ball no matter what it is. Do you believe in karma? That's what I'm talking about. What's your plans for the future, brother? Where do you go forward with it all? Well, I wrote my first book and people... Did you get a chance to read it? Yeah, I read it, brother. Yeah, that's why you're on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You like it? I know we've missed out a lot of stuff as well, but... Yeah, I love that. That's you said a lot of it ain't real. You say what? No, that's why I've had, I've got you on because I read your book, man. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it? Yeah, yeah, I wrote the second. The second one's gonna tear you up because mm -hmm. it's gonna put you right in there. Like you're gonna know what happened that night, what all went down. You're gonna know what went down with the Fifty Cent, all the stuff that went down prior to all the shit that you heard in the media stuff. Like you understand. Then uh, the Shine shit, the behind the scene, what happened with him and Shine and everything. I'm gonna tell you, I tell you all that in the second book. Um, the Fat Joe, our relationship, K Slay, Chaz Wims, the guy who robbed 160 banks. Uh, I tell stories about Pun, uh, a Big L, just. Harlem, I, I put you right there. 
Uh, the editor told me, the, who's the guy who was editing the book, shout out to uh, Floyd, you know what I'm saying, Larry Floyd, he was like, yo, Gene, this is better than the second book. Uh, the second book is better than the first book. People are gonna love, your audience are gonna love this. I start writing the third, I'm gonna do a, 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 a book of poetry and uh, recipes. You know, put poetry and recipes together, do that. And then I'm just go back and just chill, man. I'm done. I'm, I, I'm, I've, I've had a life that most people wouldn't believe the circumstances and the situations I came out of that I fought through and I believed that because of grace, it held me. The grace of God kept me going no matter what. You understand? I used that power and the grace to just get me through. So that's where I'm at, man. I just want to live off the rest of my life and Peace. just be happy. See the car crash with Big A, what happened? Oh, Lil C's was driving and it was coming off a lot and it was slippery and wet outside and he crashed it and Big almost went through the front window. See if Big A and Tupac got together and sorted their differences. Do you think that would have helped a lot of things? Oh, that would that that would help all that would have helped a lot of things and it would have hurt a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Because the industry could not move the way it wanted to move with Tupac being involved. See, you know what? Suge Knight had put in some people heads, we need to get our own publishing company. You understand? And they were gonna fight for that. And there's no way that the industry out there had took all those companies and broke up, was gonna allow these minority brothers, these black guys, to get their own publishing company and own their rights to their own rap music. It wasn't gonna happen. Do you think that's why the media brought so much attention to it? Because they knew they would eventually have got killed if they keep stirring the pot? Yep. No doubt. How do you feel telling your story again? Does it bring back a lot of emotion? Uh, it brings back a lot of emotion sometimes, but I don't hurt like I used to hurt. I, I can't stop the feeling sometimes. You know what I'm saying? When I, you know, like when I talk about big no more, when I talk about the part when um, Big went to that party when everybody was telling him not to, uh, because I think that had he went to London like he was planned on, they wouldn't have got him that day. What does what did Biggie's mom think of it all? Oh my man, she cried like a baby. She held my hand and she told me that I was just too raw just telling her everything. And she at one time, she said, I don't wanna hear no more. So, that was it. Yeah. For anybody that's watching, brother, that's maybe in a life of struggle just now, what advice would you have for them? Well, even when you don't have, you can't get, just keep working towards it and believe it. And as long as you putting in the work towards something, you understand? If you if you have to go out and you have to just make a loaf, if you can make money enough money for a loaf of bread, do that. Just keep on doing something. Don't stop doing. Don't ever stop, no matter what it is. You know what I'm saying? It's nothing too big or too little. You got to just keep on going for it until you can get where you need or you want to be at. You know, what problem is is that people, um, they want the car before they can ride the bike. You know what I'm saying? You might have to ride a bike for a while before you can get the car. Just a couple of more questions, brother. Who's the best person you've worked with? The best person? As far as what? Just to feel good and it's just a good job and you like the person, they feel genuine, loyal. Um, I hate to say, but I think it was Miss Lopez, Jennifer Lopez. 
And the reason I said that because she wasn't my principal. But I wanted to help her in so many different ways on so many different times, and I didn't. But it was good having her around. Um, yeah. What do you think the final outcome will be with Puff Daddy? That he'll never be on the pedestal that he once was, and that his name won't go down in history, and his legacy will be tarnished by his uh, arrogance and his uh, narcissism. Do you think that will break him more than anything? It will break him, yeah. Not being able to be at the award show, not being able to be out on front street like that, yeah, that will break him more than ever. He can't be a Russell Simmons and go to Bali and just chill out and not be seen. Not at all. When did you, just before we finish up, but when did your relationships change with him? Did you, have you got any hate towards him or any, like no, no. anger? Just, would, if you seen each other, what would happen? We've seen each other. What happened? You know, uh, before, he tried to send some money over to me. We was at, it was years back before the YouTube thing came up around. Uh, we was at the Kingdom basketball tournament. He sent a guy over with a wad of money like this. You know what I mean? Like, I couldn't see nothing but hundreds or whatever because Puff never carried no little money or nothing like that. So he said, yo, split this with the security. I told him to take it back to him. I don't want to split shit. Why? But well, ain't me. I ain't taking nothing from you. I don't need nothing from you. If you want to give to security, call security over there and give it to him. You're not going to buy me off like that. He said, try to send me and the guy from Felon Magazine, he tried to send some bottles over to us. Well, to me, when we was at Sin City, a strip club, you know, a dance club, and uh, I walked away from the table, and the dude from Fella Magazine said, shit, I'm, I'm popping it. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. obviously they've got the things about being fruity and uh, asking 50 Cent if he wanted to go shopping, and uh, listen, it could be harmless, but again, it is a bit fucking fruity, whether you're fruity again, nobody cares, but uh, the things with the usher and stuff, look, uh, is there any truth towards having affair with other artists and sleeping with other artists? Or is it all hearsay? No, it's not hearsay. I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, fair enough. Mm. All right. Yeah, we'll keep it for part two when you're second. <laughs> Would you like to finish up on anything else, Gene? No, nah, listen, uh, Mr. English, I'm, thank you. I appreciate you having me. I hope that the people in London enjoy this segment of your show and that I hope that I have cleared up some things and helped them know some things that they needed to know. Where can people buy your book, Gene? Just they can buy it on Amazon. Um, they sell it on Amazon and they can go to uh, Cash App or PayPal and put Big Gene 52 and put in the postage to over, from overseas plus $50 for shipping to hell. Yeah, we told them at the start we'll finish up on that. Would you like to finish up on anything else, bro? No, I'm good, bro. Gene, listen, I wish yes, you nothing but the best for the future right. and good luck with the second yes, sir. Bro. All right.